Well, thanks uh, everybody for coming, and thank you, John David, for the very nice introduction. Yes, I worked with worked with John David for a very long time because I met him when he was just a, a baby undergraduate, and it's been real fun seeing him accomplish a lot in the sciences. Um, so, uh, as John David said, for two more weeks, I'm a professor at Georgia Southern University, but then after that, I'm transitioning to a position at Florida International University. So, if you're here and you want to do a PhD, you're not already in the PhD program here at Michigan, you want to do a PhD somewhere, or you're interested in postdoc opportunities, you should definitely uh, let me know, because those will be uh, opportunities uh, in my lab there. And today I'm going to talk about our work thinking about how organisms respond to a changing environment. Um, but before I get started on that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what my lab does, what I'm interested in. Um, so I'm really broadly interested in the evolution of diversity. And that's because uh, phenotypic diversity, functional diversity, represents the raw material that's acted upon by natural selection. And to the extent that this diversity is underlaid by genetic diversity represents the potential for adaptation. So if we study the evolution of phenotypic diversity, we can understand history of past adaptation. And in the context of my talk today, we can understand the potential for future adaptation. And I think it's part of my fascination is this, I've always been drawn to these fundamental ideas of how organisms can appear so different in so many kind of beautiful forms. But if you want to study evolution of diversity, you can take a lot of different approaches, um, all of which are interesting and valid and lead to cool uh, conclusions. Uh, first, you can think about where the organism is found, its ecology and biogeography. And that's, of course, inextricably linked to where it's embedded in the tree of life. Um, at the level of the organism, you can characterize that diversity using tools like morphology, physiology, functional morphology, you know, developmental biology, a lot of those other traits. And then if you want to understand the mechanisms that regulate those phenotypes, you can use tools like studying gene expression and transcriptomics or understanding the actual genetic variation that underlies these traits. So uh, in my background, because I'm interested in these broad scale questions, I sort of take tools and tricks from all of these different uh, fields in my study. So I consider myself an integrative evolutionary biologist. I'm interested in questions that are motivated by evolution, but I will often study physiology. I often study things in the context of their phylogenetics and so on. And so um, uh, work in my laboratory is relatively diverse, but it can be segmented into a few major different categories. The first is that I'm really interested in diversification, in particular what I call functional diversification. Diversification of traits that, that have links to the animal's uh, ecologies, et cetera. And so, um, one of the studies that we're working on right now is understanding evolution of skull morphology, feeding, and trophic gene expression in uh, this cool group of snakes called Tantilla. Um, I also am interested in studying the evolution of color. So this is probably the group, that, the thing that I've been working on the longest. This is work that I started uh, with Dr. Allison Davis Roboski back when I was a baby grad student and she was getting ready to start a postdoc where we're interested in the evolution of color pattern, particularly in the context of uh, mimicry. Um, I've also, for my postdoc, started some work looking at the evolutionary physiology of sexual dimorphism. This is actually the work that's been funded by the NSF in my laboratory. This involves looking at transcriptomics to understand sex bias gene expression and uh, uh, the evolution of growth regulation. And then what I'm going to be talking about today is my work on the evolutionary and physiological response to climate change, or put more broadly, the biological uh, response to climate change. And so we're really interested in this because obviously climate change, in the context of the climate strikes that are going on now, climate change is something that is happening right now. Um, but we're also interested because we think that this is, these rapid climatic shifts are something that has happened throughout the Earth's history. So one good example are so-called dunsgard Oeschger events. These are apparently globally synchronous rapid shifts in temperature that have occurred over the past 100,000 years or so. And there's a lot of debate over how synchronous these are and whether or not there's a certain periodicity to these events. But certainly, and in this paper in Burns et al., they used isotopic signatures in order to correlate these uh, temperature shifts across, uh, across different areas. In this particular paper, I think this was in India. Um, but what's unquestionable is that there have been these rapid shifts in the Earth's climate. So if we try to understand how organisms are going to respond to this threat to biodiversity, which is global climate change, we can also understand something about sort of the basic evolutionary biology of how animals deal with a changing environment. And the environment is changing rapidly, and I've already mentioned global climate change, which in the areas I work, the tropics, 
like this right here. This is an aerial image of uh, central Panama. It looks very nice in that picture. Um, and uh, these, all of these habitats are supposed to become hotter and drier and more variable with climate change. But of course, climate change isn't the only thing that's happening, global climate change. There's also climate change and environmental change that's been initiated by human land use patterns. So if you go a little bit north of the park, this is what you see, which is a landscape that's dominated by clear cutting for agricultural purposes. If we zoom out a little, that's aerial shot is this area right here, but we've got the giant sprawl associated with Panama City and the canal zone nearby. And so that's fragmenting the landscape. Well, it turns out that when you fragment a tropical rainforest, you essentially replicate or intensify the effects of climate change. You tend to make these, these uh, tropical rainforest environments hotter and drier and more variable. And there's one particular group of organisms where this is predicted to impact them strongly, and that's in tropical ectotherms. So these are a bunch of tropical ectotherms that all happen to be lizards. And many of the Animals that live in these environments have evolved under a historically stable climate for the past few million years. As a result, some of them have lost the behavioral trait of thermoregulating, so they're all thermal conformers. That is to say, they don't shuttle between patches of sunlight and, uh, and shadowy patches in order to regulate their body temperature. They kind of function like little eye buttons in the field. They're the temperature of their uh, microclimate that they're found in. Um, and there's some thought that they may have lost the ability to have phenotypically plastic responses to changing temperature, and even potentially have lost genetic variation associated with changing temperature. And this, these are all traits that make them subject to threat from global climate change and anthropogenic effects on the environment. And in fact, there's been a whole flurry of papers started, I think really drawn the lost most attention to back, I think it was in 2010, with a paper that showed that there's been erosion of lizard thermal niches associated with these declines, and in some case, extirpations of lizards. And so um, we're interested in understanding how will these lizards respond to a changing climate. And um, there's really probably four ways that a tropical ectotherm, like a lizard, can respond to this changing environment. Um, the first is that they can go extinct. That's an outcome that we want to avoid. The second is that they can uh, pick up and move somewhere else where the climate is more favorable, shift their range to somewhere else that, that, that is more similar to their native environment. This is maybe a reasonable thing for large mammals or birds if that habitat exists, but that's not really possible for a small-bodied ectotherm that doesn't disperse very far. The two that we're focused on, or the two ways that you can respond that our, my lab is focused on, is phenotypic plasticity. I know there's a lot of different ways of thinking about plasticity with canalization and fixed phenotypic plasticity, developmental plasticity. In the context of this talk, I'm using phenotypic plasticity to describe when we can measure a trait in, one, in, in a single lizard in one environment, and then measure it in a different environment and see that trait change, or see a shift in that trait. The other way that they can respond is via evolutionary adaptation. So we have examples of animals evolutionary, uh, of an evolutionarily or genetically adapting to an environment. This lizard here is a cordylid lizard that's found on the very southern tip of Africa. In this population, all of the lizards are melanistic. They're completely black, and that's linked to the fact that they're in this cool temperate environment where black is a favorable color for uh, thermoregulating. And what's especially interesting is that these are not separate uh, processes. In fact, phenotypic plasticity and evolutionary adaptation can interact, and either and uh, phenotypic plasticity can either facilitate or constrain uh, genetic adaptation. And so, um, I'll mention a little bit more later in the talk once I show you some data how we're thinking about addressing this issue in our system. And so, the big question that we're interested in understanding is how does a tropical thermoconforming organism respond to climate change? And so this is the critter we focus on. This is Anolis apletophallus. These are a small insectivorous little lizard from deep inside secondary and primary rainforest in uh, Central America. They're part of a larger group of these lizards that are found up in Costa Rica. This one's found in Panama. It's called the Panamanian slender anole. They are, uh, they are interesting for our purposes because they have a very short life cycle. They're about an annual lizard. So they only live around eight months, most of them, in the wild. And so they have the potential for relatively rapid evolutionary response. And importantly for our purposes, they can be very abundant in the right years. So we can go out and catch 100 or so of, those, of these in a day. And our general approach is to take these lizards from 
the tropical rainforest in which they are found and put them on islands that are hotter and drier and more variable than the mainland environment that they're found in. And so the way that we do this, I told you that we work in Panama, that's the country in between Costa Rica and Colombia, and we work specifically in the canal zone. And we work there because when they constructed the Panama Canal, they flooded a large valley with a lot of hilltops, and those hilltops are now hundreds, if not thousands of islands that are dotted across this lake, which is called Lake Gatun. Lake Gatun is the Panama Canal. You can see there's some big container ships that are trucking their way through this sort of central deep part of Lake Gatun, but there are many, many islands. And so our research program has really a few different, um, a couple of different approaches that we use, and I'll show some data from each of those approaches today. The first is that we use a combination of laboratory and mesocosm experiments in order to study the potential for uh, physiology to uh, change in response to these different temperatures. So we work out of Gamboa, which has an excellent state-of-the-art laboratory, and we have access to a bunch of um, uh, sort of glass houses, almost like greenhouses, where we can regulate the temperature. So we use a combination of laboratory and mesocosm uh, experiments to characterize their physiology and to characterize their uh, potential for phenotypic plasticity. The sort of centerpiece of this research project are these island transplants, where we take these lizards after we've phenotyped them, after we've taken tissue from them, and we uh, place them on these islands where we can then go out and recapture these same lizards, and we can also go out and capture subsequent generations of these lizards. So before I uh, tell you about our research, I just wanna mention this collaborative group. This is a sort of three-way collaboration between myself, my colleague Mike Logan, who's at the University of Nevada, Reno, and Owen McMillan, who's a staff scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Two of my grad students at the time, John David and uh, Albert, came down the first year when we were capturing lizards and putting them on islands before we knew that this had any chance at all of, of working. I also have a current grad student, Adam Rosso, who's working on this project. And then Allison has been working on uh, this project with us because John David's gonna be doing some of his thesis work on there, but not related to temperature and uh, phenot uh, phenotypically plastic responses. This is also, I mean, this is a, this was a uh, large scale collaborative project that was done on a shoestring budget. We funded this out of my startup at Georgia Southern University, as well as from a variety of small grants and, and funding from the Smithsonian. Um, and so uh, we've had a lot of people that have been volunteered, who've got internships through the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute that have worked on this project. And it's been a, it's been a, a, a great to work with them and this work wouldn't have been possible without them. And I was really excited to work on this project because it's a cool system with which to ask an interesting question, but also because you get to spend a lot of time on Pipeline Road, which is a world famous place for bio Diversity. This is a picture of John David not looking for lizards like he should have been, but gazing uh, towards the sky. But the diversity, the biodiversity there is incredible. You get all kinds of, there's several different species of monkeys. There's lots of birds, lots of cool uh, and some and, and lots of interesting snakes that are there as well. So it's just a fantastic place to work. And the, uh, the facilities at Stry are really state of the art and they've really helped make this project possible. So uh, I'm gonna present results from maybe three different experiments. And the first experiment that I wanna talk about is motivated by this question here. Can these thermal conforming lizards that have evolved under this historically stable environment of a tropical rainforest, can they uh, exhibit any plasticity of gene expression? I really just mean, can their gene expression change and how does it change in response to a changing temperature? And in this case, we're looking only at acute temperature changes. So in order to do this, we captured lizards from, uh, from the rainforest. We then uh, subjected them either to a control temperature, 28 degrees Celsius is about their mean body temperature. We then exposed them to a warm body temperature. This is about the warmest temperature that the lizards would normally experience. Um, I'd have to look at the data, but it's something along the order of they might experience this once a month or have the potential to experience this once a month or once a week, something like that. And then 20 degrees Celsius, which is the coolest temperature that they would ever experience um, in this environment. We then kept them at that temperature for two hours, and then we sampled their brain tissue, their liver, and their muscle. Um, the, the liver is probably the major organ that's been implicated 
in, uh, in, in adaptive responses to, uh, to changing temperature. We were also interested in how uh, gene expression in the brain would change, and we picked the muscle as another tissue to study because it's really uh, tightly linked to performance traits like running. And if you're interested, we took the muscle from their sort of upper thigh. We then uh, extracted RNA, sequenced our, built RNA-seq libraries on an Illumina platform, and then mapped those reads to the Anolis carolinensis genome. And so I'm gonna be showing you those differential gene expression results. If you're interested in our pipeline and how we went about doing this, I'd love to, to chat with you about it later. So what did we find? Well, we found that temperature does affect how genes are expressed. So on these graphs, um, I'm gonna be using kind of a similar color scheme. The red indicates response to the warm temperature. The blue indicates response to the cool temperatures. On this graph, I'm showing the number of genes that are differentially expressed. We used a, uh, a, a false detection rate cutoff. You can use a log fold change cutoff. There's a lot of ways you can define this, but we simply looked at the number of genes that are differentially expressed in each uh, normalized library. And then on the x-axis, they have the two temperature treatments, warm and cool. So it's, it's important to note that this is the number of genes that are differentially expressed in response to the control temperature treatment. So we're comparing not cool and warm to each other directly, but cool to control and warm to control. And then I'm just showing the genes that are upregulated or downregulated. So there are two patterns I think that you can see here that are pretty straightforward. First is that these lizards are differentially expressing many more genes across these tissues in response to the warm temperature. And so maybe a, maybe a secondary note on that is that we see generally similar response to a changing temperature among tissues, except that the brain is differentially expressing vastly more, tissue, vastly more uh, genes than the other two tissues. The second is that there's this interesting ratio of the number of genes that are upregulated compared to downregulated in response to either warm temperatures or cool temperatures. That is to say that they almost always upregulate expression of genes in response to changes in temperature than downregulate genes. I think both of those results are probably explained by the fact that when you have temperature changes, protein misfolding is an issue, both on the warm side and on the cool side. And so you're often expressing genes, things like chaperone proteins, et cetera, in order to uh, respond to that changing temperature. And so there's really dramatic shifts in gene expression in terms of number of genes that are differentially expressed in response to acute temperature changes. Another way that we can look at this, rather than simply tallying up the number of genes that are differentially expressed, we can actually look at the magnitude of the change in gene expression. So what I did to do that is I simply uh, took all of the genes that were altered in, in expression in response to either the warm temperature treatment or the cool, cool temperature treatment and was, uh, compared to the control treatment. And then I looked at the number of genes that were up the, the excuse me, not the number of genes, the magnitude of the fold change in gene expression, okay? So these genes, this is sort of the uh, sum of the average magnitude of change in gene expression in response to warm temperature in the brain. This is the average negative magnitude. I separated out uh, upregulated genes and downregulated genes because otherwise they would cancel each other out. Um, and what's interesting is you see a similar sort of pattern where there's the magnitude of gene expression change uh, the magnitude of the uh, change in gene expression is higher in response to warm temperatures than it is to cool temperatures. And you can see this pattern across all of the treatments. And so these genes, that, but these genes that are, um, uh, the genes that are changed in expression in response to warm temperature, we see a similar sort of pattern where there's a similar number of genes that are upregulated in response to cool temperature as are upregulated in response to warm temperature. And so we can look at this pattern a little bit further by simply looking at the transcriptomic response across the entire transcriptome. So this is the transcriptomic response to, to cold. That's the log fold change of the cool temperature treatment compared to the control treatment. On the y-axis, it is the transcriptomic response, uh, transcriptomic response to the warm temperature treatment. That's the warm temperature treatment compared to the control treatment. And what you can see is there's this very strong positive correlation among all of these three tissues. What that means is that genes that are upregulated in response to a warm temperature also tend to be upregulated in response to a cool temperature. So this implies that there's really similar mechanisms that are uh, in similar direction of transcriptomic response to warm and cold temperatures, but the magnitude of that change is different because you see less of a change in response to cool temperatures than you do in, to warm temperatures, both with the number of genes and the magnitude of that change in expression. 
So those are transcriptome-wide patterns. We're then interested in understanding what are the genes that are differentially expressed. And first, I'll just tell you that the first time I got these results back, I looked at the differentially expressed genes for the tissues that, for the muscle and for the uh, uh, liver, which didn't have that many differentially expressed genes. And I looked, and sure enough, there were some heat shock proteins in there. There was, uh, you know, HSP40, HSP70, HSP90, genes that you might be associated, that you might expect to be associated with changes in temperature. If you do a sort of gene ontology enrichment analysis, this is just an analogist that asks if there's any genes associated with biological processes that are over, uh, over expressed or over, uh, over represented in your data set, you get these among the liver and the muscle, you get these four, these four uh, 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 go terms, these four biological processes, protein stabilization and folding in the cellular response to stress and to heat stress. And so this is consistent that what we're seeing with these shifts in, um, in gene expression is caused by the temperature itself. It's not just simply a response to being in a new environment or, uh, or something like that. Uh, I'm not showing you the data for the brain because when you differentially express a third of your transcriptome, uh, everything is enriched. And so what we did next is we identified a set of genes that are associated, that, that already have a known function in response to temperature invertebrates. These are, include a lot of heat shock proteins and other genes that would be associated. And sure enough, when we look at their average log fold change, we see a similar pattern as to the entire transcriptome. This is about 80 genes that we were looking at where um, they tend to have a stronger response to warm temperature than cool temperature. And there are more genes that are upregulated than downregulated in response to the change in temperature. And so this tells us that this transcriptomic response to temperature change involves these heat shock proteins and similar. And so this is a, definitely a temperature related trait. And so what this is telling us is that lizards have the, these lizards have the potential to respond to acute changes in temperature. This is probably doesn't, isn't that surprising. It's certainly possible that you would need to respond to suddenly, you know, being trapped in a ray of sunlight or something like that in a rainforest. You might, your body might heat up quickly and you'll need to have some sort of adaptive response. So our next question was what happens with a more long-term or chronic change in uh, temperature? In other words, can these thermal conforming uh, lizards from tropical rainforests exhibit plasticity in their physiology? and in fact in their gene expression, but I don't have the tissue samples back from Panama yet, in, in response to chronic environmental change. So in order to do this, we captured lizards again from the tropical rainforest. Um, we then uh, measured their traits, a bunch of thermal associated traits. Um, I'm gonna tell you today about the results from measuring their critical thermal limits. To measure their upper critical thermal limit, we measure what's called upper voluntary temperature or actually voluntary temperature maximum is what we're calling it. This is essentially um, the temperature at which the lizard really wants to get away from the warm temperature it's experiencing. So you put it in an incubator and you'll see it will suddenly try to really escape uh, the container. It's a really repeatable measure and it's the only measure of upper thermal limits that we could measure in this lizard because they're really, really flimsy lizards. They, don't, they would not do well if you measure the upper limit. For critical thermal minimums, the, the measurement of the minimum temperature at which these lizards can function, we used a kind of standard approach where we cooled the lizard down to the point where they could not right themselves. And that's a pretty good measure of as cold as they can be and, and still function. We then took these lizards and we placed them into mesocosm. These are these glass houses here that fortunately for us had an air conditioner attached. One of the glass houses, we kept at a temperature to replicate that of what we've measured in the mainland. Um, and so it was, a rel it was relatively cool compared to the warm temperature treatment, where we allowed it to uh, be about two degrees hotter in maximum temperature during the hottest part of the day. Um, it's worth noting that this, this is a much more variable treatment than just putting them in an incubator because they're experiencing dial variation in temperature and, and so on. And so uh, this is, this is uh, I think, a little bit more realistic, but also probably Probably potentially a little bit messier. We then took those same lizards, we remeasured all of these, uh, all of, we remeasured those same traits that we measured at the beginning. We also measured things like metabolism, and I'm not going to talk about that right now. What we found was that there does appear to be shifts in these thermal traits in response to temperature, at least for one thermal trait. So this is the voluntary thermal maximum. I'm showing you the data for the control treatment in blue and the warm treatment in red. And you can see there's a significant increase in the voluntary thermal maximum in the warm treatment and a non-significant increase in the cool treatment. 
So the next question is what's happening with the minimum temperature treatment? And we see no significant effect. They don't differ, initial and final don't differ in any treatment, and we don't see any, uh, uh, we don't, they're virtually identical at the end of the, experience, end of the experiment. And this is a little different than some results that we found in the field, so it's, it's an interesting thing to see. But what this does document is that there is a plasticity, at least, of this upper thermal limit. We were also interested in uh, plasticity of their uh, uh, thermoregulatory behavior. So, or not thermoregulatory behavior, sort of uh, uh, behavior in response to thermal traits. So these lizards aren't thermoregulators, but um, you can still place them in an arena and allow them to pick a body temperature that they prefer. And the way we do this, we attach a temperature probe to them and just let them choose this. So you end up with a distribution of body temperatures over the period of time that you have them in, there, in that arena. Um, we can then extract a lot of different uh, variables from that uh, temperature distribution, such as mean and range, and that's what I'm going to show you here. Well, what we found is that there was no effect on the temperature uh, that they chose, their thermal preference. It didn't change at all if we look at the mean. It doesn't change if you look at the range. There's a bunch of other things you could look at. We don't see any difference in those. And so there's no change in sort of the thermal conforming version of thermoregulatory behavior, of where they tend to spend time. And much like you'd expect, they're not tightly regulating where they are spending time within this arena either. So what this has told us is that these tropical lizards have the potential to respond to changing temperature. And this runs counter to what I think the dogma was for a lot of people who are interested in tropical ectotherms. The dogma was that they are going to have limited ability to exhibit any plasticity of traits associated with response to changing temperature. And yet we can see that in the short term they can shift gene expression and there's phenotypic plasticity of at least one important thermal trait. So the next set of experience, experiments that we, that we were interested in is what is the transgenerational response to a realistic and rapid environmental change? And so the way that we uh, were able to do this analysis is through island transplants. So um, we, we capture lizards in the mainland and then we put them on these islands. And of course, this ex I've been setting this up as a stepwise thing, but we, we set up this experiment first, of course, um, where we're capturing lizards and putting them on all these islands. Each island is its own unique entity. Each island is an individual. So they all, uh, all, are, are di are all differ from one another and differ from the mainland. But all of them are either hotter or drier or more variable than the mainland. So they all have a changed temperature regime on these islands compared to the mainlands. They also all feature a more uh, higher density of stinging hymenopterans. So these islands are generally hotter and drier and more variable than the mainland. Here I'm showing data just for maximum environmental temperature. If we pick out that one variable, you can see that six of these islands are hotter than the uh, mainland value right here, although a couple in terms of maximum temperature are not hotter. And so the first question that we were interested in asking and answering is, will these tropical rainforest lizards even survive on these islands? Um, and how well are they going to do on these islands? Um, at this point, we've transplanted more than what I'm showing here, but uh, within a, with a couple of years of the study, we transplanted about 10 islands. And of these, uh, on these 10 islands, we wanted to know, will they survive on these islands? And what we found was that on eight of the 10 islands, the lizards did persist on these islands. I should mention that these are very small islands. Many of them are not much bigger than this room, maybe, maybe some the size of this room or twice the size of this room. Um, and they don't have any other lizards, or so we thought. Um, and uh, and the, in the two cases where the lizards did not survive on the islands, because one of them, it's not that they didn't survive, it's that we, we were not using it anymore because it formed a land bridge with the mainland, and another island uh, was flooded. We thought we went out during a very wet year, but the following year was wetter, and so that island flooded, and so we don't use it anymore. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on this talk is, is on three islands where we have uh, good population size on those three islands and where we have uh, we had the ability to really thoroughly characterize them over a couple of years. Um, and so the second question is how do these lizards do on these islands? All of these islands are uh, hotter and drier, more variable than the mainland. There are a number of reasons that you would expect that this would impact them. And so we looked at how this impacted their body size and, and sort of uh, body mass. What we found is that on these islands, they're all smaller than they are uh, on the mainland. Um, on this island here, they're around the same length, but on all of the islands, they have 
less mass. And of course, if you calculate a body condition residual, you see the same thing where for this, with the same body size, they tend to have, uh, they tend to have smaller, uh, they tend to be skinnier, they tend to have less mass. And so this is consistent with the fact that these islands might be a little bit a harder place to make it. Um, they have decreased size and body condition. These could be a more challenging environment um, for them. Our next question is, does ecology or morphology diverge on these islands? So one interesting aspect of uh, climate change, either global climate change or more local anthropogenic climate change through habitat alteration, is that it can create, um, it can really alter habitat structure. So beyond simple response to temperature, you might expect the environment to change in a way that lizards would need to respond to. And so uh, we went ahead and measured habitat use of these lizards on the mainland on the island. For every lizard we catch, we measure their perch height and perch width, their perch diameter. And what, you, what is evident, perhaps particularly evident on this island, but is true on all of the islands, is that if you look at the ratio of available versus the uh, used habitat, there is a, uh, a relative shift in the type of perches that they're perching on. In other words, on the islands, they tend to be perching on average on a little bit uh, thinner diameter perches, or excuse me, war uh, sorry, wider diameter perches. And so these wider diameter perches, what's cool with the knolls is that we understand how uh, functional morphology is related to perch width in a knolls really well. And the understanding is, is that when you have a wider perch, you need wider hind limbs. And in fact, um, we can make that prediction that on these islands they should have wider hind limbs and, and, and or longer hind limbs, and that's in fact what we see if you control for body size. If you compare the founding generation to the F1 offspring, they have longer hind limbs. And so this is an example of where they're uh, exhibiting a sort of morphological response to changes in habitat structure with this rapid environmental change. Um, it's, it's worth noting that this isn't necessarily uh, solely uh, a uh, uh, evolutionarily adaptive response. This could be phenotypic plasticity as well. And this is something we're interested in, in looking at in the future. Um, so, but the main, the, the, one of the main questions that we were interested in is how do they respond to this uh, changing temperature? Because we took the lizards and we put them on these islands. Uh, the islands that I'm showing you data for, for these three islands, um, all of which have a mean environmental temperature that's about a degree Celsius above that of the mainland. That might seem to be kind of subtle, but in the context of a tropical rainforest with historically constant temperatures, this is quite substantial. And what we found is that there are shifts in these thermal physiological traits uh, consistent with this. So across these three islands, compared to the founders, there's this increase in the F1 offspring, the first generation offspring, in their maximum voluntary, voluntary uh, thermal maximum. So this is the temperature at which they try to get away from the warmth, as well as in their critical thermal minimum. So this is different than what we found with the phenotypic plasticity exper experiment. And so there's evidence that there's been these uh, strong physiological shifts, or at least detectable physiological shifts, in response to rapid um, environmental uh, change. And so what we've learned thus far in this system is that there's regulation of gene expression in response to acute changes in temperature. In response to more chronic changes in temperature, we can see phenotypic plasticity of at least some thermal traits. And there is the potential for rapid response to environmental change in natural populations. And so I think when we started this project, we were really focused on thinking about evolutionary adaptation and genetic adaptation to the environment. But as we've gotten these results and we've become more interested in the relationship between uh, genetic adaptation and phenotypic plasticity. And so there's really three main ways, three categories of ways that you can think of how uh, uh, phenotypic plasticity and genetic adaptation can interact. The first is through something that's called plasticity inertia. This is similar to behavioral inertia. The idea is that because the organisms can exhibit a plastic response, under the genes that underlie the thermal traits never see selection. And so this can slow down or completely uh, stop the potential for an adaptive response. On the other side of the coin, you have these concepts like genetic assimilation and accommodation which address how phenotypic plasticity can increase, increase the range of phenotypes that can, that can experience natural selection, and potentially through the evolution of increased canalization can allow a, an adaptive uh, response. And then, and some people would consider this part of this, uh, part of this uh, uh, category here, you can get actual evolution 
of the potential for phenotypic plasticity, an actual evolution of the potential for a gene expression response change to the environment. And so um, we're just starting to address these questions, which are probably best addressed with genetic uh, means in this system. So we're currently uh, uh, working on generating a genome for uh, the Panamanian slender anole. Um, we've, got, uh, we've already got some preliminary reads on that. We're also developing a very large uh, SNP panel using uh, either DDRAD-seq approaches or exome sequencing uh, in order to try to um, well, first off, do parentage analysis so we know the reproductive output of the lizards and we can look at fitness and that means. We'll also be able to uh, potentially uh, use that in order to uh, detect, uh, detect loci that are associated with high fitness on islands and high fitness uh, uh, and uh, uh, genetic loci that are associated with thermal traits. Um, and this is a, you know, we're going to all this effort, we're putting all these lizards on islands. And so we've got a lot of other ongoing projects that address this. I'm just gonna mention a few of these now. One interesting thing that we found with this lizard is that they have sex-biased parasitism, where the males have many more parasites than do females. And what we've found is that it seems to be just the fact that the males have this dewlap, which is a really favorable place for mites to attach. And so this is potentially a case where you have a, uh, ectoparasite cost of a sexual signal that's not linked just to the immunosuppressive effects of testosterone. We're also using this as a model to study sexual dimorphism because they're not particularly sexually dimorphic. So um, these anoles are about as close as you can get to a sexually monomorphic species. With thousands of individuals, we can't detect a difference in their length, and we can detect only tiny differences in their mass. Females are slightly heavier than males. And so uh, we're using this as a comparison to my other work on, the, on growth regulation in order to study this, in order to study sort of uh, how sexual dimorphism evolves in the anoles, which, ex which exhibit a lot of species that are sexually monomorphic and species that are highly sexually dimorphic. One trait that these organisms are sexually dimorphic in is their dewlap. And so uh, this is uh, what John David's going to be working on for his dissertation here. Um, but this project takes advantage of the fact that these islands that differ in their, thermal, uh, in their thermal environment also differ a lot in their light environment. And so we can test some really cool ideas about, uh, about how light environment can shape dewlap evolution. And what's super cool, and I didn't take this picture by the way, John David did. Um, what's really cool is that they are a polymorphic in the area where we collect these lizards. So they can have either a solid dewlap or a bicolor dewlap. And so it gives us a cool opportunity to look at how dewlaps evolve in the context of light. And then some of the stuff we just started this year and we're starting to get some cool results back for is about how there can be shifts in the sort of metagenomics of these lizards in response to these changing environments. So um, when you put these lizards on islands, they probably have a different prey base. Uh, they're experiencing a different thermal environment and you might see shifts in their microbiome. And in fact, we have seen on islands compared to mainland with some very preliminary results that there seem to be shifts in the taxonomic makeup of their uh, gut microbiome. Um, and we've assessed this in a number of different ways by collecting fecal samples, but also by uh, just sequencing everything, you know, I had to kill some lizards and take their guts out anyway, so we would sequence what's in their, uh, what's in their uh, uh, small intestines as well. All right, so that's what I've got for you today. Before I finish, I just wanted to acknowledge again all of these excellent collaborators that have worked with us in the field uh, over the years. It couldn't have been done without them. Um, I've been funded and supported by NSF on this project a little bit, and then mostly through the Smithsonian Institution and Georgia Southern University, and I would be very happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I was uh, recently doing a project on the uh, population of, of invasive Burmese pythons in Florida. Oh, cool. And uh, there is some evidence there that, uh, it, it, based on how often they're dying due to extreme cold in Florida, <laughs> that uh, they may lack an instinct for cold avoidance, or they may have a stronger exploration instinct than their cold avoidance instinct. And I'm just curious uh, if you went into any uh, of that kind of like how tropical adapted species don't understand the concept. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. So um, with this particular lizard, they are thermal conformers. They're the temperature of their environment. But it's not like they're not noticing the environment that they're in. So these lizards will come out 
only when it reaches a certain temperature. So they're not thermoregulating in the sense that a physiologist that studies a western lizard would say it. They're not moving back and forth between sun patches to maintain a precise temperature, but they only come out when it reaches a certain temperature. So these lizards, I think, can detect changes in temperature. They basically hide away at night, and if we get out to catch lizards early in the morning on a slightly cooler day, you won't see anything until, until or you'll see very few until the temperature reaches a certain level. So that's an interesting question. Now, Burmese pythons are thermoregulators, I believe, um, uh, it, because they're found in these open environments, at least in certain life phases, they are thermoregulators. So it's interesting that they don't have the ability. I know I'm familiar with, um, with some of the work out of Todd Casto's lab with that. That's pretty cool. Yes? Uh, you found a large number of upregulated genes in the brain. Yes. Uh, have you noticed any behavioral differences in those on the island? We haven't. Um, uh, so we had a student do a project looking at flight initiation distance. We thought that when put on these islands, maybe it would change. So flight initiation distance is a thing people measure with lizards where you walk towards the lizard and see when it freaks out and runs away. Um, and she did not, uh, we've just got those results back and it doesn't look like there's any change in flight initiation distance. Um, but they are changing their behavior in the sense of they're changing where they perch. And certainly there's a potential for changing uh, a, lot of, a lot of things. Um, I've been looking through the literature and it seems like in some species you do detect this really big response by the brain in response to a changing temperature, which makes sense because it's an important organ to keep functional. And so um, uh, this could be a measure of how sensitive the brain is to changes in temperature. Yes? Oh, that's a great question. So to answer the first question, um, which was uh, the, the fitness question, well, that's one of the reasons that we're building pedigrees is because then we'll actually get to look at fitness associated with thermal traits. We'll actually be able to see, okay, this lizard had a high voluntary thermal maximum. What's their reproductive output in terms of, uh, in terms of animals it's sired and grandsired, et cetera, sort of the classic definition of fitness. So that's something that we'll be able to do. Um, we've done some viability selection analyses um, and have found uh, we have found greater survivorship of, of animals that have higher voluntary thermal maximum, but our recapture rates weren't super high, and so we're a little, we're a little dicey about, about presenting that at this point. For your second question, how does this compare to closely related species? Um, they, we haven't compared them to anolis, to limifrons, or any of these others. Um, these are very different. The, the other species with, that, that my collaborators studied these kinds of questions in is the brown anole, Anolis segrii, and they're a thermal regulating animal on hot little desert islands or hot little sort of tropical islands like in the Bahamas, and they have very different uh, uh, thermal physiology. We're working on a paper now that's kind of characterizing these two different species now they respond differently. So they certainly, um, but what we haven't looked at is the uh, change in gene expression in response to temperature in brown anoles. And so that's something we're looking to do in the future. So I hope to know, <laughs> I hope to know the answer soon. Yes? You're talking about the islands being more variable and islands can be uh, less variable or more variable in different things. What are you in particular talking about? What, what is it? Uh, we're mostly talking about variation in temperature. So they are more variable in temperature because they have more edge effects. And so they tend to see higher dial swings in temperature on the islands compared to the mainlands. Um, yeah, you might predict that they're more similar in terms of like humidity, right? Because they're surrounded by all of this water. And so they may actually be relatively constant in that context. Yes. Well, that, that's a great question. So our general approach for measuring the environment is we put out uh, thermal loggers on, on little pieces of wood that we super glue them to and put them out in the environment uh, in a range of places where you could expect to see a lizard, building an operative temperature distribution in kind of the classic thermal biology style. Um, we, don't put them in, we don't put them in anything resembling a, like a refuge. 
And so certainly there's the potential that they may not thermoregulate, but they can seek out a thermal refuge in their environment. Um, because there, there are a lot of species that do that, that most of the snakes in the tropics are not active during the day and spend most of their time underground. So yeah, that would be something interesting to do. We try, uh, at least for this initial phase, we're trying to identify uh, the kind of range of daily active kind of uh, environments. Yes? That's a great question. So we didn't. We only did this experiment on males, um, and we did that because it was cheaper uh, than sequencing both sexes. But this is something that we should do. I think that would be really interesting to look at. They do have slightly different habitat preferences. Males tend to perch a little bit higher than females, um, but I don't know if we would see that or not. We did actually sequence some female Apletophallus, but only at control temperatures. One more question. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, no. So yeah, these lizards are pretty small. They're one to three grams. Um, and so we just open up the skull and I try to get all the brain. Um, so this is one reason why I tend to be a little hesitant with the brain because it, fortunately we get pretty similar where the variation among tissues among individuals is not that high within the brain. But certainly I do worry that you could be missing, you know, people will study just a specific brain region and we're trying to get all of the cerebrum and cerebellum and, 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 and top of the spinal cord when we're doing this. So hopefully it's standardized. Um, but yeah, I think it would be fascinating to actually pull apart and look at specific, uh, look at the specific gene region, uh, brain regions, because I imagine that would be even more interesting. I think it's pretty incredible though that we were able to detect so many differentially expressed genes given such a kind of crass approach to looking at gene expression in the brain. I have one last question. Yes, sir. So you mentioned that you found, so we initially thought that there were no other <laughs> but that is no longer the case. That's uh, correct. So do you think that the islands that have another species of anole, will those other anoles affect these results? They will. So I was showing data from, a, from the single species island. But as John David pointed out, among those eight islands where they persisted, we went out and released lizards on lizardless islands. And then we found there was another lizard there, which John David identified as Anolis gagei, which, is, which has a different colored dewlap. So it's kind of a whole cool different set of questions. Um, and there are some interesting things going on. On the two species islands, all these lizards have the, these trombiculid mites. And on the two species islands, they keep their mites. But on the single species islands, we haven't found mites once we release the founders out there. And so it seems like having you know, a population of lizards out there is really cool. So I think it could, it could impact the results, particularly if you have competition or something like that that's restricting access to their preferred environment. And so we continue collecting data on both the native island lizard and our introduced island lizard in order to see if we'll see, any, uh, see anything interesting there. They're not at very high population densities compared to a pletophallus. I think we only cat, have recap, caught like maybe 10 or 15 a year or something like that on those islands, but they're definitely there. All right, well, can we thank Christian one more time? Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.